the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. So what a weird transition as uh, we are being warned that the chaff will be thrown into the fire. The very next line is sort of a castaway line like, and after that he went on with several more exhortations about the good news. It hardly seems all of that, all that good. In the overall summary of today's readings, we have two readings that remind us to rejoice, to be glad, to celebrate, you brood of snakes. What's the disconnect here? And now as we get ready for that beautiful story, one of the most tender stories uh, marked on all of our hearts, the story that has us all with good cheer, all a little more deeply caring and aware of one another, uh, we have these warnings, these exhortations, this difficult news, this warning that you brood of vipers, be careful. What's going on here? I kind of think that the road to joy usually comes through some honest and difficult truths, some acknowledgement and change uh, that pulls us out of wherever we are. I think we need John to get to deep joy. I was thinking about this, and I recalled back when I was uh, in high school, and I really went out of my way to try to do just well enough that I stayed beneath my parents' radar. Um, I figured it also gave me plausible deniability when I was trying to feign a fever before a paper was due if they didn't know there was a big paper. But uh, my sister was sort of the opposite. Every academic uh, pursuit was known to my mom. Uh, and my poor mom, who is deserving of sainthood, had to walk through every paper, every test, uh, you know, hand in hand, um, usually fisticuffs uh, with, with my sister. Uh, it, I would come home from whatever sports practice and I would hear the two of them going at it uh, and uh, quickly make a beeline to the kitchen and then uh, for uh, a snack right before dinner and then up to my room. Um, but it wasn't easy. And I remember sort of like my sister's inclination. She would know there was a project and she'd give my mom this elaborate list of supplies. My mom would get them all. Um, and then my mom would sort of very gently say, so, do you have your plan? Of course I have my plan, mom. What do you think I am? And then next thing you know, she'd start cutting and you know, uh, shaping everything. And all of a sudden, she'd come back an hour later, and all of the materials are destroyed. And there is nothing that looks anything like the project that she was supposed to do. Uh, and my mom's first reaction is, what did I tell you? Where's your plan? And then she'd see this look of absolute panic on my sister, whose paper or project, or whatever it was, is due the next day. And she'd take a deep breath and gently sort of lay out four or five things that could be done to somehow turn this mess uh, into a viable project. And, uh, and, and with that patience that only a, a mom can generate, uh, she would sort of start going through all of the little things and work with her and calm her down, and they would get to a place of relief. Uh, but you know what that feels like, that feeling, that knot in your belly when you have something due um, and it just sort of feels like the more you, you dig, the deeper you get? Um, I might not have experienced it as badly in uh, high school, but when I got to college, uh, that seemed to be my mode of operandi, to dig as deep as I could get and then uh, find myself in a point of panic, uh, mostly academically, but I don't really blame myself because they scheduled classes before two in the afternoon. Um, and often had classes while my friends were playing video games, um, you know, and I mean, who could leave video games for a, a class uh, for a very expensive college class that your parents might be helping to pay for? Uh, so I was disaster, but I also blame my less than fully uh, uh, formed frontal cortex. Uh, but, uh, but I remember that feeling of feeling like, if I don't drop this class, I'm, I'm going to fail. I'm going to fail. Um, and then finally having the courage to both talk to my parents and acknowledge where I was uh, or talk to the teacher who might give me you know, five actually doable steps, uh, going to class being the first one, uh, to get out of this predicament that I was in. Um, and then one other thing about college, uh, a warning to those who might go to college someday, uh, you know, there's these tables set up outside of like the student union or places where you can get a Bob Marley t-shirt a black light poster, and a credit card, uh, unbeknownst to your parents, all for free just by signing your name. Um, and so, you know, you start spending on the credit card, and then you realize that uh, they want their money back and, uh, and that they're keeping track of how much you owe and charging interest, and it's an important lesson to learn at some point in life. Uh, but that feeling of being underwater, 
Uh, and until you really acknowledge it and deal with the difficult truth of I got myself in over my head, uh, you can't change. And once you start to realize, okay, if I start making payments uh, and I cut up that credit card, uh, I can actually get out of this. And then you can have a lightness and joy, uh, which is what we're called to. So I don't think there's as much of an incongruence as it might, uh, might appear between these readings. John starts off trying to get everybody's attention. He might not be the gentlest uh, uh, preacher out there, but you brood of vipers was meant to make sure everyone was paying attention, that everybody was realizing, you, listen up. This is worth changing. You are not where you could be. You are not fully realizing your life, the purpose of your life. And if you do that repentance, that metanoia, that changing your way, you can walk uh, closer to God, who is coming into the world. And he's talking to the Jewish leadership. He's talking uh, uh, who uh, are basically uh, taking in and lining their pockets at the expense of the most marginalized and disenfranchised. He's talking uh, to the tax collectors who've marginalized themselves by uh, extorting a little extra money every time they collect taxes. He's talking to the soldiers uh, who have used uh, um, the, their, their military might to get a little extra money on the side and sort of bully their way to a little extra. And he's saying, here are ways doable ways that you can change your life. And you can change the life of someone else. If you have two coats, give one away. Now, for us who probably have more than two coats, uh, you know, we're going to have to figure out, what are the logical steps? Is it giving away one coat? Is it giving away half our coats? Is it just uh, an awareness that we have a lot more than we need and figuring out how we can uh, do that to take care of people who don't have the basic needs met? But John is giving us a roadmap for getting out of that feeling like we're just not fully realizing the person that we were made to be, which is really where our joy comes from, from fully living into the person we were made to be. And so John does have some hard words. I think those are words on the way to joy. So I have kind of a John the Baptist in my life. Uh, it's this woman who calls me quite regularly, um, and then she'll get really upset with me and not call me for a while, then she'll call up again. Um, but uh, she called up about a month and a half ago, and she said, you know, Father Ben, uh, I'm sorry about the way we left things the last time. I'm really sorry, but I need uh, uh, for you to fill up my, Kroger, my uh, food line card. Um, and she sort of talks to me like I'm uh, her her bank, uh, and that uh, it's her money that she just wants it loaded up, and she'll say, if you could just put $100 on my uh, food line card, here's the number, uh, just call me when it's loaded, and then kind of, you know, gets off the phone, and, um, you know, so I, and I, I've done this a few times, and so I do it, and I give her her, Kroger, uh, I mean, her food line card, um, and then she calls up, uh, and she's uh, staying at, at the motels, and we've worked uh, over the years to try to get her in and out of the motels, um, you know, that uh, really kind of drain a lot of people's resources. Uh, one of the things that all of us should be acutely aware of is that affordable housing is, a, is, is at a crisis point in Fauquier County. We do not have places to live. Um, that are affordable for those that uh, work at the grocery stores, um, work at uh, the gas stations, work at the, the hospital and, and, and uh, lower income jobs. We do not have places for them to live. So they live in motels, which they can't afford. Um, and so I'm trying to help out. And I said, when you get into your uh, apartment, uh, I, I can't pay for your motel. I refuse to do that, but I will pay uh, a good bit of your first month and last month's rent. So you tell me when you get there. And she went to several places and said none of them panned out, uh, but she's hungry. And so if I could use that money and just put it back on her food line card, she'd appreciate it. And I said, well, I can't do that. I, you know, that money I have uh, set aside for, for that. And she said, well, that's my money. You, you told me I could have it. I said, you know, um, but you know, nonetheless, I said, well, I, I will make uh, some phone calls, and I'll try to find out what resources, you know, she's, she's actually in Culpeper. Uh, so I got a whole bunch of phone numbers, and I called, and I said, here are the food pantries, and here's some people who could uh, help you. And, uh, and she was very quick to say, she said, you know, Ben, I don't think you get it. She said, the last meal that my mom had was crackers with mayonnaise, uh, and you're telling me to go to the food pantry, but I have no kitchen because I live in a motel, and I have no place to store or cook my food. So it does me no good. And all of a sudden, as I've gone from Christmas party to Christmas party, feeling very logical in the way that I've been uh, dealing with all of our interactions and, uh, and, 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 and very much feeling like I was on the right side of things, all of a sudden, it was like John the Baptist, you brood of vipers. Don't you realize the difference between your life and my life? 
Yeah, I might be edgy. Yes, I may be angry. Uh, and there may be a whole history of ways that I got to this place. But my mother had crackers with mayonnaise on it, and I don't know where my next meal is coming from, and I can't just go into the food pantry and get a whole bunch of canned beans that do me no good. And every bit of money that I have will get tied up in motels. What are you going to do about it? How are we going to live our lives a little differently? The beautiful story, the tender story, the story that draws us all here, the story that we're walking toward is a story where everyone had to go somewhere to get there. Jesus didn't come into the comforts of everyone's lives. Even Mary and Joseph, even nine months pregnant, Mary had to walk several days uh, to get to the place where Jesus would be born. Shepherds had to leave their flock uh, in the fields and go. The wise men had to travel far and wide. All of us are called to go. Jesus doesn't promise that he will come into the convenience and comforts of our lives. But he promises that when we change our way, when we enter into that metanoia, that repentance, and we walk toward God, towards the fullness of what God made us to do and to be, God will meet us there. So what are the definable ways in our lives that we can walk more closely, that we can walk to the place where God will meet us and truly believe and know that God is with us in the way that we live our lives? Amen.